want to thank so many of you for coming on in. Uh, you, you guys are just the cream of the crop, so thank you so much for coming on in. What you're going to see here, Blistered Fingers, is a talk that I developed for the Dallas Symposium when I was asked to provide a field collecting program, one that shied away from the use of mechanical aid and mechanical equipment. So what you're going to see here is my rendition of that talk called Blistered Fingers, Field Collecting in the States. The most important thing that we got to worry about is access. Are we going to be able to get into the places that we want to go? And there's usually a number of restrictions that we'll have to face as we're trying to get access into our properties. But it's just another one of the hoops that we'll have to go through. And it doesn't really matter whether we're working in an open pit locality like this quarry here in Stohomish County, Washington, a locality that yields some beautiful calcite crystals, big white flattened wombohedral crystals, and we can find some nice things in these types of quarries if we can get access. And the same thing happens if we're trying to work underground. It's another bunch of hoops that we've got to jump through, but if we're able to negotiate those waters, we can get into some pretty pretty terrific places like here at Darwin, California. So even trying to do everything right, we can be in the wrong place at the wrong time. This was a spot local to me here where I live in Clallam County, Washington. I was up digging one day and I noticed a whole bunch of alarms and sirens down below and I decided to go back to my vehicle. And as soon as I did, the green Ford right here pulled on up, blazing on up this road. And minutes later, these two cop cars came on up following. It ended up that these two guys had ripped off this car and had the whole back of the truck full of stolen goods, including two armfuls of rifles that they ran by me holding. The only thing I could think to do was to look down, not make eye contact, and tell the cops that they went that way. So we can be in the wrong place at the wrong time, even if we're trying to do everything right. You just never know what's going to happen. So again, the whole idea here in this talk is to shy away from using mechanical aid. We're going to use tools that we can use by hand so that we can effectively get underground, stay above ground, so that we can collect these types of unique treasures. Now the bummer is, is that with mechanical aid, we can really get a good recovery. We can load up the truck. You can see here, I'm almost dragging on the tires there. This was a wonderful field collecting season that we've had back in 2005 at the Rat's Nest. And from that collecting season, you can see we just collected an incredible abundance of specimens. This is the benefit of using mechanical aid to do our collecting. But again, we're going to shy away from that. We're going to talk about a smaller tool rack that we've got that we can use in our collecting. This is a scene here from underground at the Rally Mine. We've got the ladders. We've got the hammer drills there. We've got some different climbing aids and respirators. These are the types of tools that I want to talk about today. Because with those, we can also be very successful collecting. We can fill our backpacks. We can have our goofy, lopsided smiles. And we can find treasure, too. So this is about as hardcore mechanical as I want to get, is getting into the places that we want to collect. This is a two-wheel drive, chain-driven motorcycle. It's not a fast motorcycle, but it's got incredible torque. This is a type of motorcycle that will climb a wall and you'll fall off of it before it stops getting traction. So getting into a locality can be very important, especially if we've got an abundance of materials that we're trying to collect. This is my new beginnings claim over in Idaho, and every single white piece of material that you see there on the hillside is either an agate nodule or a crystal plate. So there's just an incredible abundance of materials here. How do we get it home? We can load it on up in those buckets and we can haul those till the cows come home, but in the meantime, I'm going to be about six inches shorter and I'm not going to be happy at the end of the day. So having that type of mechanical aid to be able to get in and out of the deposits is really crucial for being able to haul out some of these heavy loads. Now this is an example of the material that was found there littering that hillside beautiful little fortification agate nodules, little geodes, all of them lined with a bright, bright orange skin of hewlandite. This is an example, and there's millions of these lying on that hillside. The agates get bigger, though. We've recovered agates on the hillside that go up to about 80 pounds. 
This was about a 10 pound nodule here that when we cut it open, I was absolutely amazed to see such fine color, fine patterning. And then when we held some of the slices up to the sun, we found out that it was an actual little color change agate, and it just got all the better. So this is the type of material that we were picking up just right on the surface. Good example of a quartz covered calcite crystal specimen. Again, some of the things that we can recover from the New Beginnings claim. This is a claim that I went ahead and staked specifically for the kids. I do a lot of kids talks and I wanted to collect treasures abundantly so that I could share them with the kids and that's really what's made this deposit such a wonderful one to collect from. Now bicycles. If I can't have motorized aid to get on in, I want to have a bicycle so that I can cover my ground. This is working in the low, low pass area back several years ago before the closure that has locked off this area to collecting now. And you can see right here, this is my blue tarp that I'm getting ready to head down on into. We were working through the clear cuts. We're looking for dark black smoky quartz crystals at this particular locality. And there we had some real good luck. Basically, we were hiking through the clear cut. We jumped over a log and landed on a three pound quartz crystal. And I decided that this would be a good place to dig. By the time we were done, this 12 pound quartz crystal is the biggest that I was able to find. Friends found a 16 and then later a 27 pound single quartz crystal. And this was all from a float area that had developed from crystal pockets eroding out many years before, trickling down slope. And then once we identified that float layer, we just traced it and all along that entire layer it was just crystal after crystal after crystal it was very fun we loaded backpack loads and you can see here I've got some of the quartz crystals set aside over here on the side so this is about as intense as I'm going to get beyond the motorcycle beyond access these are the types of tools that I'm using very much these days using mechanical hammer drills 36 volt units like we've got here are the predominant tool that is in the pile. And we've got Hilti, we've got Makita, we've got Bosch, and then we've got a big demolition hammer here. This is about a 35 pound hammer. It runs off in an electrical source. And you can see here the different types of steels, the different lengths, the chisel bits. These are the types of things that I'm gonna use with these handheld hammer drills in order to be effective in the field. Again, if we use big tools, we get big tool recovery. And I'd love to have this be the focus of the talk, but again, we're gonna shy this down a little bit. We're gonna stay away from the big drills like we're using here at the PC mine. And we can open up wonderful pockets. This was a three foot pocket that we opened on up. The main plate here with this big crystal came on out as a dinner plate sized, beautiful, beautiful specimen. But this was the type of thing that we were able to find by using more hardcore drills, heavier drills, and actually blasting. So we found some beautiful things, including these Japan Law twins. Real nice twins are really the epitome there at this deposit. These are the things that we're looking for. This is about a four inch twin right here. This one's got a nice little mica phantom and is a complete floater twin. These are the types of things that we're trying to recover. So this is what I'm going to use, and this is going to be my main mechanical focus, is using these types of 36-volt hammer drills. When I go into the field, these are very light drills that I can take, put them into a day pack. I can travel any place that I want. Typically, I'll run a couple of drills side by side to keep the drills from overheating. I'll run through a battery, swap on over to the other drill, and then I'll run that one until its battery is done. When I do my underground work, I'll take up to 10 different batteries underground. So I'm underground for hours, and these are really my work choice tool. Along with that, I'm using a product called the Micro Blaster. This is a very small portable unit that I can put inside of a day pack with my hammer drill and I can become very effective. This will shoot, blast the rock in a way that it'll allow me to work on into and hopefully expose some beautiful crystals. So this is a very light portable unit and along with that hammer drill, it's absolutely crucial. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead, we'll drill on into the ground here you can see this is an iron oxide stain and just up above here is where the crystal pocket was exposed. This is all freshly blasted rock. You can see here the scar from where we drilled down. This was our first shot and all of this cap rock was blown off. So now we're coming on in. 
We're going to do another hole right here with the idea of blowing this off and then getting into the crystal pocket next. John, that was, used, that was with the uh, microblaster? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And this is the type of material that we were able to recover from that. This is a beautiful sceptered quartz group, and this was among 27 sceptors that came out of this particular pocket. What really made these scepters exceptional is that the majority of them had two-phase inclusions within them. And this gives you an example of what the best scepter looked like, in my opinion, the one over here on the left. It's skewered by another scepter. It goes straight through the center of the crystal. It enters the crystal first as a sceptered crystal. You can see the step. And then it comes on out as a reverse scepter on the other side. And these types of penetration twin pyrite crystals are also one of the things that we can find up on the Big Chief Claim. The Big Chief Claim is a very dangerous place, though, and it's one of the places that when I'm going on in to collect, I really have to be careful. Now, these are examples of some of the very common tools that everybody is used to using, ladders, shovels, picks. Probably the most important tool that I've got here that some of you may not be familiar with is the fin hole shovel here. This is a real great shovel that's used for removing rock, and if you're trying to do it with a blunt nose shovel like this one, you've all hit rocks before and it stops the shovel dead. This one with this type of a long extended reach here, it's able to go through those rocks and you can kind of push them on out of your way. So we'll use these, we'll use the picks, we'll use the rakes, the hose, the bars, everything else, very common tools that we're gonna use to recover treasures. Now this is one of the least common ways that we can use said tools, but uh, this was a, a really great locality that we worked several years ago, the Gopher Valley Quarry. We had to go in about two miles on the road to get access into the pit, and the way we did that was by putting this 20-foot ladder on top of the bicycles and rolling it on in. Now, I'm disappointed that I never took a picture when we came out because the entire top of the ladder, I had strapped on boxes and underneath the ladder, we also had strapped on boxes. We hauled out approximately 2,000 pounds of material and we did it in one rolling trip. It was awesome to use the bicycles in this sense. So this is what we were doing when we got into the pit here. I'm about 35 feet up on my ladder there. And basically what we had was a four inch hole. And the four inch hole was either gonna be one of two things. It was gonna be a pocket that had not been breached other than to be opened, or it was gonna be a pocket that had already come off the wall and I'd already missed it. So the mystery was finding out if this was actually gonna have something within it. Now I've used a little bit of adaptation and creativity here by rigging on up this. This is a six gallon plastic melt container here and I've used this to raise and lower the specimens so that I was able to stay up on top of the ladder. I had a buddy down below so he would take the specimens on out of there and then I'd bring it back on up and load it up again. So as we opened up that four inch hole, this is the view into the pocket. We're looking in here about six feet and what we're looking at is the finest natural light pocket that's ever been recovered from the state of Oregon. But more importantly than the beautiful natural light crystals that are lining the top of the pocket, because of course everything down below was covered with dirt, all of this material was all destroyed, except for the beautiful calcite crystals that were sitting in several areas there. But what I want you to focus on is this little spot right here in the back. I was up on my ladder, I was telling my buddy down below as I'd peeled back the wall that there was a crystal pocket here and there was treasure waiting to be recovered. And then I got excited as I looked back into the hole and the light reflected off of my hard hat and as it did so, it illuminated the pocket completely and this back feature was shown to me and I knew we'd found glory. This is what that ended up by being. It was a 40 pound calcite group, approximately a foot high, a foot wide, almost a foot and a half wide. The exciting thing about it is that this ROM face right here held a one inch bubble that traveled three inches across the face. It's one of the biggest in hydro bubbles I've ever seen in a calcite crystal group. I was unbelievably happy in that once I came down off the ladder, it was about 90 degrees in the pit, and thankfully there was enough space within that chamber that with the expansion that went on because of the temperatures, it did not break the calcite group, and the calcite group is complete, beautiful, 
and it's now sitting in the Rice Museum in Hillsboro, Oregon. This is what it looked like right afterwards, just a quick wash, and it's one of the beautiful things that we were able to recover by using ladders. This is another ladder experience that we had a few years back. This one was written on up in Rocks and Minerals magazine. When we came on into this quarry, we found a solid wall there where you see the black hole there above the ladder, and we noticed a little bit of white. That was a natural light patch, and as we started to remove the natural light, it opened up into what was going to become a 10-foot long crystal pocket, big enough that you could sit inside of, and it was full of exquisite treasures really soft, delicate, feather-like, natural-like crystals in lengths up to three inches in groups that were up to 30 inches across. This is a picture of the exceptional calcite group. I think it's probably the finest calcite that's ever come from the state of Washington. It's a floating calcite crystal group. It's beautiful yellow, and it's just one of the exquisite things that we can find if we're willing and we have the ability to collect from these types of localities. Now here we are, we got a pick here up on the top. We're digging by hand. This is altered andesite, and this is the rat's nest claim that many of you may be familiar from seeing some of the hewlandite and mordenite specimens. Prior to bringing in the mechanical aid and cutting a thousand foot cut, we were out on the hillside and we were digging by hand. And this shows a nice crystal pocket about two feet underneath the surface, and we're pulling on out big, beautiful plates of mordenite. They're still clean and perfect. And these are the types of scenarios, again, that we can get into with just hand tools. We don't need to have mechanical aid if we can get on in and we can work the rock like this example. This is one of the best pieces that we've ever taken from the rat's nest claim. I donated this to Rudy Chernick and gave it to, through him, to the museum. It's now in their collection, and I do believe it to be the world's finest mordenite specimen. It's a little over a foot across big, beautiful snowballs of pristine, furry, covered crystals. This is exactly what I'm hoping to recover. This is an example of some of the finer hewlandites that comes from the rat's nest claim. We get this beautiful orangey pink color. When I find these crystals, they're actually hydrated, and they're actually a neon orange when I open up the crystal pockets. It takes about six months for the color to stabilize as the fluid within the crystals is lost and then we end up with the stable color, and this is what we're hoping to find, and just a beautiful example. This is about six by six inches here. So we're gonna use our bars next. I'm in a pillow basalt quarry here in Mason County, Washington. I noticed this pillow on up here on the wall where so many other things were broken. This was a complete pillow, so I took my bar on up, started jamming it on into the rock, eventually was able to make this crack here and this crack, and then we're gonna peel off this piece right here, and underneath, this is the crystal pocket that was exposed. Beautiful, sharp, brittle, natural light crystals with an exquisite little floating yellow calcite crystal. And while I did have to use a screwdriver, a tool that I'll show you here in a couple of minutes, this is what we can get when we've got the bars, when we've got the picks, we can open on up the rock. This is the goal, is to try to find a crystal filled chamber within that rock. This is what that specimen looked like cleaned on up, knocking the dirt off of it. This is a piece in my collection, about four by four inches, and this is what we're hoping to find. So very familiar tools again, hammers, screwdrivers. These are uh, little probes down here. Knee pads on up here. These are special chisels that I've had made, and these are some other special chisels that I've had. These are pocket robbers here. This one's 42 inches long. The goal is to be able to get deeper into the pockets than other collectors were able to do, perhaps allowing me to recover specimens that they had missed. Now, I've done a little bit of modification on top of these special chisels. The easiest one is to look at is this little hammer here. So basically, the handle is as long as my fist is, and with a small handled hammer like this, I can get into a pocket, I can work the pocket. If I've got a long handle, I'm gonna be smacking walls and everything that I don't wanna hit, but when I've got that little handle, I can get right on in there and really do a good job. These are special gloves on over here. These are impact resistant gloves. They'll take away that shock, keep my hand a little bit, little bit better. This baby here is 30 pounds. I don't even like that hammer. So we've used mechanical aid. 
We've got an excavator that has scraped open the walls here, but when it came right down to it, the tools that we needed to collect were the little probe and the screwdriver. Here's the pocket right here, and from that pocket we were able to recover these beautiful sceptered crystals. This is Peterson Mountain, a locality that many of you are probably familiar with. Okay, we're opened on up. Another pillow basalt pocket here. We're looking at a pocket that's approximately 30 inches deep, about the same wide, and the tools that were really effective, again, were a long bar here and a screwdriver. So we're getting underneath the plates, we're prying them from between the rock and the crystals. This is a clay layer that we've got here, and if we carefully slide our screwdrivers here underneath these plates, we can get them to lift on up. The biggest plates that came out of this pocket Two of them, one at 17 inches, one at 19 inches. This gives you an example of what one of the calcite crystal groups looked like that came on out of that pocket. Exquisite gem bright crystal, very bright and shiny, lining that delicate natural light that surrounds it. This is one of the most unique specimens that I've ever collected and is one of my flagship specimens. This is a natural light crystal group, a sea urchin if you will, but it's completely black from included both pyrite and clay. So this is a unique specimen. I've never seen its like from any place else. It's a little pie sliced wedge that's about seven inches tall by about four inches wide. The natural light crystal group there about two inches wide. Climbing gear. So often in the Northwest, we're faced with vertical extremes. And if we're gonna go into this type of an environment to collect, having climbing gear and a rudimentary knowledge of how to use that gear is gonna be what's gonna get you safely home at the end of the day. I've never broken a bone. I've never been hurt in any of the collecting that I've ever done. If I get hurt, I can't do what I do. So safety is always the most important thing that I'm trying to emphasize in every type of adventure that I go. So we've got my harness here. We've got some climbing rope. We've got some ascenders here. We've got all sorts of little climbing gear, the carabiners and whatnot. This is what we're gonna use if we're gonna get on into collecting vertical extremes. And that's what we're dealing with on my claim up there in King County, Washington. This is about a mile and a half up valley from the more famous spruce claim that many of you are likely familiar with. The Big Chief claim is all in cliffs, and the nightmare about that is that we typically get rockfall that will begin about five or six hundred feet above us. And when that rock comes down, you're in a shooting gallery. There's no way to avoid it because it's bouncing off one wall and then trilling off another one and odds are you're gonna be right in the wrong place at the wrong time. So we always have to be careful, always, always. So here we're gonna work a crystal pocket up in Big Chief. Pocket's right in here, I'm working my way to it. I've taken out a couple of little minor plates here, nothing really extreme, other than the collecting environment itself. This is just exactly as vertical as it looks. We're doing a lot of Spider-Man here. We're hanging from our fingernails. I move across the face very, very confidently. Without rope, the majority of the collecting that I'm doing, I try to be very safe. I move slowly. The only way that I can do this is if I don't get hurt. But when we're going to work in these types of extremes, it's just a matter of time, and then we're going to have to get on the ropes. So here I'm working, this is about a 300 foot face right here. I've got about 100 feet below me of free fall. This is a great place to play Superman, but the landings are pretty rough. So we're gonna go ahead, we're drilling on into a pocket here. The only way that we could get on into this particular area was by doing rope work. This is an example of one of the crystals that came on out, and it is a poor example, I apologize. What I'd like for you to focus on right here is the tad bit of blue that you get. We've got a very, very thin actinolite crystal that is forming as an inclusion within these crystal groups, yielding a turquoise blue phantom that is just absolutely exquisite, but it is very difficult to capture on film. But this gives you an example of some of the quartz that we were able to recover from that crystal pocket. So here we're gonna play in the ropes again. 
when we first started work in the rally mine several years ago and we were going down the incline here there was no ladder we have since installed a ladder there now so that you can climb down on into the depths making this a much easier descent but I want you to notice here the red every time I work down there you absolutely come on out head to toe you're red from the oxides within the rock that you're working and it just absolutely makes you filthy but down there we were able to find some incredible both wolfenite and mimetite pockets. Many of them were on a barite matrix. So this is showing one of these fresh crystal pockets that we've just opened up. This pocket here yielded approximately 10 flats of wolfenite and mimetite specimens. This shows you an example of what some of those specimens look like. Beautiful orange mimetite balls lying on a barite matrix with the wolfenite there. We didn't get into some of the biggest wolfenites that you've ever seen. The crystals at their best were about three quarters of an inch. Gives you another example, beautiful jammy crystals, just a wonderful collecting experience, incredibly delicate collecting, but with a good job and a good pocket, we were able to find some truly exceptional pieces. Along with that, down into one of the lower layer levels that we were able to access, and this was a level that hadn't been accessed for probably about 50 years. We found down there some incredible chrysocolla veins that were going on. This gives you an example of some of the quality, and as you can see here in this photograph too, it's very thick, it's very uniform, it's a beautiful lapidary material. And this was an example of some of the other treasures we were able to recover from the rally mine. Lights, helmets, packs. We need our packs to get on into the places that we're going. We need it to contain our gear that we're gonna take on in. And in this case, we're getting ready to go underground here. So these types of lights here are the typical lights that most people will find in their Walmarts or wherever they're shopping. They typically offer a lighting gauge that takes you up to what's called 70 lumens, 40 lumens. My lights here that I'm using are approximately 400 times brighter. So where here I can light on up a little 12 foot area, with my lights I can light up a 100 foot passage. When I'm underground, so many of the places don't have signs telling you how to go and how to come back out. Being able to have these types of lights to light up those underground working environments really helps you to get safely through those workings to be able to come back out at the end of the day. This gives you an example here. I'm underground, I'm working in the Himalaya mine. It's a tiny little dike here, but as you all know, some of the most incredible tourmalines that have come from our country have come from this dike. And here I'm working, I've got my respirator, I've opened on up the pockets using the hammer drills here. I've got my primary light here and brand new batteries in my backup light here. Even with the two lights on the cap, I typically take a third light underground. It's awful dark underneath there and I'd rather see my way coming out. So this gives you an example of what that pocket ended up by yielding. This is material that we found recently and it was absolutely phenomenal. This pocket here was two feet wide by four feet deep. It took me five days in order to work it and some of the specimens that we took out were some of the finest that I've ever found from this locality. This gives you an example of what some of the crystals look like with just a brushing off with a toothbrush underneath the hotel sink. And we really found some neat things here, big crystals. A lot of the crystals that come from the Himalaya don't achieve this type of width. So it was a nice pocket. Most of these specimens here were all lost to the mine owner I, in the split that I did. And most of these crystals here will be used for carving. Now these are the specimens that I was able to recover from that pocket. These next photographs are all pieces now that are in my personal collection. I thought this was probably the finest of the tourmalines that we collected. It's a little over four inches tall. It's a compound crystal, beautiful color, nice and jammy. The only damage that we had, this was a break right here. I was able to glue it together nice and complete other than this little chip out of the corner. And this really makes for an exquisite specimen. This shows you what one of the nice little thumbnail sized tourmalines that we took on out look like. Absolutely gem, a nice little sidecar of quartz there, doubly terminated, poised on the middle of the prism. Real beautiful thumbnail specimen. This is in Stretch Young's collection currently. This is an example of a yellow tourmaline that I was able to recover from another pocket that I worked. It's the only yellow tourmaline that I found and I found its color to be very enchanting. 
So, if we're going to work, we need to, again, be safe. So many of the particulates, the airborne dust that comes from our working can be harmful to us. So I want to go ahead, I want to wear respirators with the appropriate style filters here for what I'm working on. And I want to have ear protection too. There's a lot of pounding, a lot of hammering. And if your ear's right next to it, that's going to eventually degrade your hearing. So we'll try to use these types of safety-oriented tools as often as we can. And a real good example of a locality that we needed this type of gear was the Red Cliff Campground of Gallatin, Montana. Basically, I'm taking this photograph from my campsite out of the back of the camper, and this was right on up there, just yards away. We talked to the campground host. He said, go on up there, find all the crystals that you can. And while we were digging, there was a number of different families that came on up with little claw hammers, hoping to find crystals. When we showed up here, we showed up with 100-ton jacks to remove some of the rocks that were in our way so that we could get into other areas that other collectors hadn't been able to access. And this is what we found when we went inside of the cave. Wonderful support columns here. These are all about four inches thick. They're holding up boulders that weigh thousands of pounds. This is a place that I definitely didn't want to get on into. You never know when something's going to shift, something's going to come down. And like I like to tell folks, I'm the soft thing in a very hard equation. So the ugly here is all this black that you see up on top. This is all back guano. And we had to go through sections of bat guano that were up to several feet thick. We also had a carnivore den that was inside of the cave that we had to go through. Lots of matted hair, bones, extremely gross digging. But from there, we were able to really do some great recovery. So here you can see I've got my hat. I'm wearing a hair net to keep all the dust out of my hair. I've got overalls on, trying to keep as much of this material away from my body as I can. In the foreground, you'll see these are all crystals that have already been recovered here. And what we ended up by doing is I found a soft spot in the floor of the cave. I took this 18 feet underneath this boulder pile, and underneath there I found a five-foot room, and that five-foot open room yielded all the specimens that we collected. This is the largest piece that we took on out. This is 110 pounds. All of these calcites are absolutely gemmy, and they're just covered with a light coating of clay. So what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and take a quick rinse, and this is what shows up once we've removed the clay. These are incredibly beautiful crystals, some of the finest that come from the state of Montana for calcite. A lot of these are twin crystals, as you see in this example right here. Very common at this locality. Crystals have achieved lengths up to about six inches, though I've heard of rumors of other caves in this area that are supposedly holding crystals up to several feet long. A rumor is only that until we can prove it true. This gives you a great example of what one of those calcite twins look like. And the thing that makes these calcites so exceptional are these chevron stripes that will form here along the cleavage planes of the calcite. These are unique. I don't know of any other locality. And in exceptional examples, you'll have these going off the other side, too. And they look like military sergeant stripes. So they're a pretty neat little thing that we get as an additional bonus for these crystals. Sadly, this has become the most important collecting tool in my arsenal. I'm getting older. I don't have the ability to see as sharply as I can close up. And so collecting tools now include my reading glasses. And without them, I'm pretty ineffective. I've got to be able to see my close-up work. So these things are now uh, absolutely necessity for my collecting. But we can do other things for tool adaptation, too. Now here I'm using a carpenter's saw. And we've gone to the other side of the planet. We're now down in Tasmania. This is a Gaussian, essentially a huge rust plug that we're finding crystals within. And these are crystals of the beautiful neon orange mineral crocoite. So the underside of this rock is completely comprised of beautiful damage-free crystals. And what we found out is that the Gaussian was actually soft enough in areas that by utilizing a carpentry saw, we can actually cut the specimens right off the wall. I'd never heard of anything like that, but it proved to be very effective and these are the type of exquisite specimens that we were able to recover. During this recovery effort, we recovered two five-foot plates, two four-foot plates, and nearly a dozen three-foot plates. 
We had a crystal pocket there that was 40 feet long. I decided that was such a big pocket, it was completely inappropriate to collect little things. So I decided we'd try to take out the wall. Here we are, new frontiers of 2L adaptation. That's my pick right there I'm poised on. We're uh, contemplating the hill and how we're going to go ahead and move forward here. So there's lots of uses for these things. As long as we're creative, we may be, may be able to find the perfect way to use these tools. So first aid. Eventually, we're going to get into a situation where somebody's going to get hurt. So I always carry first aid kits with me, and it is something that I hope never to use. But if we have to, we've got the training, we've got the skills, and we're going to make sure that we all get to come home safely. Because we're going to put ourselves into some pretty goofy position. Uh, this is a crystal pocket that I found up at Peterson Mountain in Montana. I'm reaching about three and a half feet into the pocket. I'm absolutely stuffed. Notice my toes digging in down here. We call this the dead John pocket. But from that pocket, one crystal came out. One crystal. And from that pocket, this was it. Everything else was sharded and damaged, but this is the one that really made it fine. This is an incredibly glassy-faced citrine twin or a citrine scepter with an exquisite phantom right underneath here, too. So here we are. We're getting in another one of these crazy positions. I'm in a highway road cut right here. Cars are zipping by me 50 miles an hour, and I often wondered what they thought as they saw my legs sticking on out of the wall. What I found here was this round, perfectly round hole in the face. So I climbed on up the cliff, noticed within it that there were crystals. This is what I found. My gear here is about 12 feet in. In order to get into the pocket, I had to put my hands ahead of me. I humped the ground a couple inches at a time, working my way on into the pocket. This is a log that was encapsulated within a tertiary flow, slowly burning out and eventually yielding this perfect cavity where it had once resided. The walls all around are lined with hewlandite crystals, and what I'm going after are these big root beer colored calcite crystals here in deep. Now the sadness was this little clot that you're seeing here on the floor. This is a, a section of upraised material right before the root ball. So I could see on in there it was a five-foot open chamber. Crystals were everywhere, and I couldn't get into it because of that little plug right there. I called all my friends that had young children, trying to entice them. <laughs> Nobody would send their kids my way. So sadly, these crystals are still waiting for somebody to find. Needed a yeah. <laughs> Another example, here we're belly crawling along the pegmatite. Uh, this is an area that they call Chinatown in the Himalaya mine. I'm about 100 yards into the working here. Everything is crawling along my belly. What they did is they took out the dike, and that's the only thing they took out. Once I got on in here to this point, this is where I turned around. It dawned on me that if something happened to me, my stink wouldn't even get out to the mine. This was very deep workings. It was a wonderful place to go and explore, but it was a scary place to be. So we've got to be careful, because no matter what, as safe as we're trying to be, accidents are going to happen. This is work in the mobile mine just out of Las Vegas here. This is an underground mine that we were working for five days. I think I was on site less than 20 minutes. I got hit by a rock that fell down a shaft. It was just a blind fall, but it clipped me right in the head. I didn't know I'd been hurt until I walked on up to friends. They noticed that I had blood dripping down my face. I had no idea that I'd been cut. This is an example of what we were going for. This is a large area here. This is all fractured and broken. This is all material, little brecciated fragments here that are all cemented by wolfenite. So this is a wonderful zone. We're pulling out these little fragments here. And beyond them, we're finding these voids that are lined with the wolfenite crystals. So here we're looking at a pocket that's about a foot across. All the wolfenite crystals are kind of a caramel colored. They're fairly complex. This shows you what we were able to recover from that working area. This is an eight-foot table. We filled up three eight-foot tables with specimens. And this gives you an example of what some of the pieces look like. Beautiful little floater, a little bit of garbage here where it showed some attachment point at one time. But this we were just able to lift right on out of the pocket. 
And this gives you some other examples of what some of the wolfenites look like that we were able to collect from this occurrence. What I thought was most phenomenal about this particular place is that as we were working outside, we actually found outcrops with wolfenite crystals up to an inch on the surface. And personally, I thought things like that had only been found 150 years ago. And sure enough, right here, we were able to find them. Going in after them, we were able to do some fantastic recovery and really pulled out some beautiful pieces. Sometimes things get really, really intense. This is going on up to Peterson Mountain. This accident happened at about 1.30 in the morning. I had a $30 part that failed on my truck at the wrong time. It took all the vacuum out of my system. So the engine was gone, the brakes were gone, and I'm heading downhill backwards. I remember distinctly thinking as the truck went over that this wasn't going to be good. But if we can survive all of these extremes, we get to enjoy camp life next. And camp life is one of the joys of being out in the field. We get into some beautiful, beautiful places. And it's these types of things that I really enjoy, sharing camp with friends. And you can see here from the particular accommodations that I'll be sharing with you, uh, this is the bed that I found outside on a collapsed cabin site where we were digging those wolfenites at the mobile mine. I hauled this underground. We stayed in that mine and worked it for five days underground. I took the bed underground, rebuilt it, and that's what I slept on. I'd like to say it was sleeping on a feather, but it was a bit more challenging than that. Now, many of you are perhaps used to five-star restaurants. How about a five-burner stove? This is about as best as we could do over in Darwin, California, where we'd actually rebuilt one of the old miners' cabins there. We were able to keep the mice on out, and during the time that we were working this deposit, we lived here in this house. And as you can see there, we're cooking on up goodies. This is bacon, and no matter what, when you're cooking bacon, you win. <laughs> well, I think I'll just let this photo speak for itself. Um, if you're one of those people who like to read while they're in this type of a place, well, this will break that habit real quick. Uh, minus 20 degree wind comes blowing through the slats in that door and you know you don't want to be sitting on the throne any longer than you absolutely have to. So in the end, this is what I think I do. I think I'm up braving the elements up on the cliffs hoping to dig my crystals. I may not have pterodactyls coming at me like we do here on this illustration, but it doesn't mean that the winged insects aren't coming. So every single one of these is a mosquito. This was the mosquitoes that landed on us just in the time that it took to take the photograph. So it's fairly extreme, some of the places that we can get, and the animals, the insects can really help to add to these extremes. In order to keep it real, I've started collecting, I started a collecting journal. I now have eight journals that I've done, encompassing about 20 years of collecting. It's both text and illustration like you see here. I think that this is one of the best things that I've done in my collecting, is documenting these types of experiences that I've had. And having this type of a journal has really allowed me to record those moments. And if you go back in time, you just can't recall the details. Now I've got the details recorded. This gives you an example of some of the detail. I'm not a very good artist, but I try to, try to do these renditions as closely as I can. In the top illustration there, I'm doing this crystal here. I've changed the orientation of it. So this is just an outline. I've got the color zones marked here. And this is another specimen that we've got up in my hotel room right now. I'll show it to anybody who wants to come. This is a beautiful appetite crystal that was on a Clevelandite ball that came on out of one of the pockets. When I'm not out digging, when I'm not doing shows, I love to work with children. I love sharing the excitement that happens with crystal discovery. And one of the best ways I know how to do this is cracking geodes with the kids. They get to be the first one to ever see these types of treasures. And this has been an absolute joy. I've done this for a number of years now for thousands of kids and families. And it's something that I hope to be able to do for years to come. When I'm not doing this, I do a geology talk at a place called Nature Bridge within the Olympic National Park. This is an environmental summer camp where kids will come on in, and if they're doing an earth sciences curriculum, I'll go ahead and I'll do my talk, Geology Rocks, with them. So this is an example. I've got a number of different materials from fluorescent materials here, 
fossils, igneous, metamorphic, and then I do a little section on man-made minerals where I tell the kids if we don't tell a lie, we don't have to remember a lie. Nothing wrong with man-made minerals as long as we're honest about them. The newest thing is an old thing. In 1993, I was working one of the local fossil deposits near where I live, and I found a 15-foot long, 26 and a half million year old fossil whale. It's taken over 20 years for it to be formally described, but in June, they named the whale after me. The name is Sitzquake cornicerum. Sitzquake is a word from the local Clallam tribe, a tribe that's known for my area. And this is supposed to be a spirit that exists far out in the waters, known to bring good fortune. So I'm hopeful here. Uh, this is not just a brand new species, it's also a brand new genus. And I think this is a really great example showing the things that we can find if we go outside. Like I tell the kids, you don't look, you don't get to find. But if you do look, what's the potential? I really want to thank all of you for sitting on in today's talk. It's been an absolute pleasure. If you've got any questions that you'd like to ask, I'd happily ask or answer them for you. But I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you.